Okay, um, I'll introduce myself again. I'm Sarah Vaya. I'm a professor at the University of Maryland in College Park. And today we're talking about the joint problem of climate change and biodiversity loss. And the interesting thing about this is um, many of the same uh, things that got us into the problem with climate change have also caused um, degradation and loss of biodiversity. So we have overlapping causes. And I put the big asterisk on this guy <laughs> because people are the big cause. Um, and there are overlapping solutions. And so I'll be talking about several joint solutions today. That is things that policies or things people can do that will help both um, alleviate climate change, slow it down and um, either reverse or um, biodiversity loss or keep it from happening in the first place. Um, I'll talk about these bizarre pictures in just a minute on the next slide. But before I go on, I wanted to just talk about this one. Um, I want to give you an idea of what is sort of what the situation is with life on Earth. I mean, I know all of you know that, but um, when we think of the biomass, that is how much uh, actual weight and matter is there of living things on Earth, 82% of that is made out of plants. Okay, well, that's a good thing because they're at the bottom of the food chain. They're the ones who are generating all the food that's actually eaten by everyone else. 13% are bacteria, 5% are everything else. And humans make up such a paltry fraction of the total earth biomass, 0.01%, okay? So uh, of that 5%, we are a speck, but our impact has not been proportionate to our <laughs> representation among earth's biomass. Um, so that's where we're going today. Um, I want to talk to you about these two pictures because they, I, I just love them. They come from a, an article that was in the Guardian and, um, the article is called human race is just one, 100% 1, of all life, but has destroyed over 80% of wild mammals. So if we look at now all the mammals on the earth, 96% are livestock and humans, okay, 60% are livestock. Only 4% of the mammals on earth now, um, and I mean individual organisms, individual animals, only 4% are wild mammals. We've really done a number on them. In fact, here we are um, on this panel, which shows extinctions, mostly caused by humans. 83% um, of wild mammals are now extinct. 83% of the species of wild, wild mammals are extinct. 80% of, of wild marine mammals, 50% of plants, and 15% of fish. And this doesn't go into any of the other groups, but this is pretty dramatic evidence that humans have had a gigantic impact on biodiversity. So biodiversity is essentially the uh, collection of all the different kinds of living things that there are on the earth, all the different species, all of the different, you know, vertebrates, invertebrates, insects, spiders, you know, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to go through all the group, but anything that's alive, microbes, et cetera, that's biodiversity. So when I say we're having a problem with the loss of biodiversity, it means this kind of stuff. Spe species that were here before humans aren't here anymore because of human activities. So um, here's the giant cow representing 60% of all livestock on earth now. And we have the giant chicken, 70% um, of all uh, birds on earth now are chickens and other poultry, 30% are wild. So birds are doing a little better than mammals, okay? But they're still not doing that great. Okay, now how can we stop climate change and rebuild biodiversity? This is essentially an outline of the rest of the talk. And I'm going to talk about three joint solutions. There was so much more I could have talked about, but I just didn't feel I could do anything justice if I skimmed over all of it. So I'll come back and revisit some of the other issues later. These um, solutions are on top of, of course, the necessity to stop burning fossil fuels, stop, stop digging them up or drilling for them and burning them. And we need to revamp agriculture away from the monoculture high input thing we have now. So I'm not talking about that 
But th what I will talk about is on top of those things. So the three topics, stop deforestation, especially tropical rainforest. And this is a picture of a um, uh, sort of what could be called a cloud forest, a high elevation forest, forest where it's dense, 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 dense trees and, and sort of up in the clouds. This will, if we can stop deforestation, this will, um, uh, what do I have free up land for? Uh, that's wrong. It will put trees back on land that has to have <laughs> that now have lost their trees. I, I was on another planet when I typed this. Um, and it was, will of course restore habitat for a lot of wild species. Um, last time we talked about in the last webinar three weeks ago, we talked about the benefits, the climate benefits of shifting to a plant-based diet and reducing food waste. Um, it turns out both of those actions, which you can do yourself, um, are very important for reducing biodiversity loss. And this is what frees up land. If we shift to a plant-based diet, we, we get back all the land that's being used for raising animals. Um, it will reduce water pollution, which is hard on aquatic organisms. It will reduce methane and nitrous oxide. So these are the two climate pollutants, of course. And we also need to conserve between 30 and 50% of Earth's total, or Earth's um, Air, well, terrestrial and marine area for nature. So we're not talking about area in Antarctica. Um, and as part of that, we need to protect indigenous people and their knowledge and give them a much bigger say in the whole structuring of how we implement conservation plans. Um, when we think about these things, um, especially what part of the, what 30 to 50% are we going to conserve and, and whose land is it now? And what, you know, how do we structure that? Um, and this stopping deforestation is huge, just like burning fossil fuels, stopping the burning of fossil fuels. It is abundantly clear now that the pledges offered by nations, both for the reduction of climate change, the stopping of climate change, and for the reduction of biodiversity loss, we have not made hardly any headway, okay? So we've made a little headway on the, on the climate change. Um, nations have been promising to do something about biodiversity for years. And uh, there have been several international gatherings about biodiversity and various pledges made and pretty much nothing has happened. Um, so we know that these incremental changes, the pledges that nations are making are not going to work for this, okay? And everything I've been reading recently, I said, we need transformative change. Now, transformative change is hard to come by, right? I'll talk about that at the end. Um, but we, in order to actually solve the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis, we need to change our attitudes, our policies, our politics in just big, big time ways. And for this, I say, bring on the social tipping interventions. Now, some of you who have been at my webinars were at my webinars last year, heard a little bit about social tipping interventions. Um, this is basically um, when um, um, demands made by people um, uh, cause can cause the sort of tipping point and, and produce these transformative changes. Um, I'm not a social scientist, so I'm really hanging on by my teeth here, but I will um, try to say a few intelligent things about this at the end, because uh, I think people are agreeing now that this is the only way we're gonna get this really wholesale transformative change that we need to have. Okay, so let's talk about what humans are doing um, <clears throat> on and to the natural world at this point. Um, this slide concerns plants and insects and sort of the prospects of these um, organisms as we move into the future. This is a picture from um, a report from the Royal Botanical Gardens in Kew, that's in the UK, um, the state of the world's plants and fungi in 2020, calculating extinction risk for plants and fungi. So just for plants, two in five plants are estimated to be threatened with extinction. Uh, so that's 40%, um, right? Um, <laughs> higher math. Um, a lot of plants. And this picture is sort of heartbreaking in itself. It shows intact uh, rainforest here and bulldozed and burned forest over here where the trees have been bulldozed and then the scrub has been burned off. This is really a disaster. I'll talk more about that later. Concerning insects. So here's just a picture of a bunch of insects that have landed in a trap somewhere. 
Um, 40 percent of insect species are declining and 33 percent are outright endangered. OK, so things are we've already lost a lot of species, as I showed in the first slide. Um, I didn't show the, the number of plant or insect species that have gone extinct, but um, a lot have and many more are threatened at this point. Um, so, you know, we're, we're in a, kind of a bad way here. Now, what is causing native plants and insects to, de to decline? Pretty much the same things. If we look over here for native plants, the, these are color coded with the largest impacts listed first. Agriculture and aquaculture are responsible for almost 33% of um, decline in native plants. Biological resource use, that means just using the plants uh, for uh, resources like wood and whatnot. Um, natural system modifications, um, I'm not really sure what that is. Um, residential commercial development, um, invasive and other problematic species. Actually, there's been a lot of press recently on how damaging invasive species are, are to our plants that are, you know, native plants are still remaining really bad. Um, Okay, let's see, after invasive species, energy production and mining is knocking off a lot of plants and climate change. Energy production and mining is, you know, more of a problem than climate change. And this is from 19, from 2020. Okay, 87% of the decline in native plants is caused to these, um, what, seven, seven things. And they're pretty much mostly a function of, of human activity. Over here, insects. They're, they presented a slightly different way. Intensive agriculture is causing 24% of the decline in insects. Um, and then on top of that, pesticides, which of course is part of intensive agriculture, but they is so problematic that they break it out for their own thing. Ecological traits, that's like very rare species, very specialized species who don't, you know, can't live in a lot of different places. Um, uh, as habitats get destroyed, these specialist species drop out. Um, urbanization, that's almost 11%. Fertilizers, so, you know, that's agricultural fertilizers and home fertilizers. Okay, so they break that out again. Um, deforestation, wetlands, and river alteration by water pollution and, and um, you know, damage, silting, et cetera. And, um, uh, climate change or, or warming. So you can see climate change isn't the biggest impact, um, uh, although I'm sure it will grow. But again, this is the, these are responsible, very similar list to this, responsible for 90% of the insect decline. Human activities are very hard on living things. Now, a really tragic thing, I think that a lot of people um, aren't aware of, is that we don't know very much anything about most of the species on earth, okay? And so we are losing species before we even know what they are. So when scientists um, uh, discover a new species, they do what's called describe it. So they find out about it, they give it a name, they, they find out where it belongs in the phylogenetic hierarchy, et cetera. And that's called describing the species. Well, uh, there's probably up to a trillion microbes, bacteria, archaea, which are very ancient. They're like bacteria, one cell. Um, a lot of them live in strange places, so most people don't know them. And fungi, fungi are unicellular or multicellular, but there may be a trillion different kinds of these that we don't know anything about, okay? <laughs> That's a lot. Um, of possibly 10 million multicellular species that aren't fungi, only 1.7 million are even known to science. That means most of the living things out there we don't know anything about, okay? And when we destroy habitat and do other things that uh, reduces biodiversity, we are losing these things. Now, you know, some people might say, who cares? But we all care for several important reasons. Um, they're not all on the slide. Um, uh, the bigger picture is we care about losing these species because the unknown species contribute to the stability of ecosystems. So there's a lot of species and ecosystems that do similar things. And this causes the ecosystems to become more stable because if something happens to one or two of these species, there's another species or another 10 species that kind of jump in and do the same thing. So things don't fall apart. So when we lose a lot of species, that destabilizes ecosystems. And we're starting to see that destabilization now. Um, 
uh, just to be you know really uh, anthropocentric, it's to our advantage to not get rid of all these species because 50% of our drugs come from natural products. Um, plants, so here's a rosy periwinkle. It is a, has been the basis of an important uh, set of drugs. We all know, pen, presumably penicillin comes from mold on moldy oranges, okay? And that was about the biggest breakthrough there was um, uh, back in the, I think in the, 40s, I'm not exactly sure, but um, being able to make this on a commercial scale was huge, okay? Um, these beautiful snails, I put these in here, they're called cone snails. There are a lot of different species. They come in different colors and mostly have the same cone-like shape. They are very poisonous. They have a little sort of harpoon thing they can shoot out and they capture their prey and kill it with poison. Um, and um, uh, here's an uh, example of a paper saying there's up to 50,000 toxins that occur in known species of conus cone shells, um, arguing that this might be the most pharmacologically important genus in nature. 50,000 different compounds, which are poisonous to many things, but you know, a lot of drugs are poisonous, right? So this is a treasure trove of um, health-related products that we're losing without, in some cases, even knowing. I think probably most of you know that aspirin comes from willow bark, you know, probably one of the most famous natural products. But anyway, as we lose these things, um, the ones we have described, well, we know about them, but as we lose just things wholesale, we are losing a lot of um, species that could be helpful to humans as well as, you know, important for ecosystems. Okay, now what is the cause of climate change and biodiversity loss? How do we get ourselves into this joint fix? And um, I've thought about this a lot. I talked a little bit about it in webinars last year, but I think what we've got is an attitude problem in the world's richest nations. It's really basically the Western cultures. Um, there's two different ways of thinking of how humans uh, re relate or belong in, uh, in nature um, with respect to the other organisms. And indigenous people, um, I think pretty much worldwide, think of themselves as part of nature, okay? They're in here, it's funny, this picture only, <laughs> I think it only, oh no, there's a lobster. It only has mostly, you know, vertebrates and um, of those mostly mammals, but um, just think, uh, you know, trillions of microbes and 10, 10 million species um, up here. And um, indigenous people think of themselves as part of this web of living things, part of it, um, and, the, and contributing to that web. In Western cultures, we often think of ourselves as outside nature, okay? Now, the I think, I just figured this out. I mean, not that I figured it out brand new, no one else ever, has ever thought of it, but the way this makes sense to me, the, the way this difference makes sense to me is as follows. Um, indigenous peoples uh, tend to have uh, an attitude toward nature that you know, sort of embraces this belonging, the par being part of this interconnected web. Um, and some of these elements um, I, um, I learned from um, a book called Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. Um, all things, this is just, so this is very generalist. I won't say this applies to any particular group. If anything, it applies to Native Americans. Um, because that's what um, Dr. Kimmerer was writing about. All things on earth have a spirit. Life is an interconnected web. No being is higher than others. Spirit gods teach us the ways of responsibility and reciprocity. So there's sort of a higher uh, power over, over the other, um, the other uh, um, over humans for sure. Never take more than you need and use it all. And if you take something, and this means harvest or catch a fish or whatever, ask this living being from which you are, you know, maybe you're taking its life, thank it and give something back. And very important is hold all living things and the um, their contributions to our lives in a spirit of gratitude, okay? Now, this is a, um, a logo that was on a um, Native American um, um, 
toolkit that I read about. Um, and this is a depiction of Turtle Island, which was where the first human supposedly landed when she dropped from the realm above. Um, and all the other animals were here already. So humans were sort of latecomers. But what this depicts is um, the lifeblood of all the animals is mingling, this red line. It's all, they're all mingling. They're all interconnected, okay? So um, this is the indigenous attitude. Well, what about the Western attitude? Very different. Western ideas of man's place in the world are typified by uh, what's known as Aristotle's ladder of life. He came up with this about 350 BC. Um, the ladder is hierarchical and fixed. And here's a picture that was drawn, a, a, um, a block print or something that was drawn in 1305. And um, it shows this ascending ladder, okay? And at the bottom are, you know, flame and stone, in, inanimate objects and stuff like uh, oil, gas, and coal, okay? And then there's the living things, uh, plants, beasts, so they're talking about mammals, man and woman. Woman, of course, is a little lower than man in most of these um, depictions. And um, then over everyone, um, heaven, God, and the angels. Okay. So the idea is there's progress from inanimate objects to lower forms and then higher forms and then the deities. Um, and the order reflects the scope for dominion over things below, you know, you're wrong on the ladder. Um, higher forms have dominion over lower. So God, the angels have dominion over humans and then humans have dominion over everything else, including all the inanimate stuff, okay? So given that this view of nature is really dominant for you know hundreds of years, right? Since 350 BC, it's very easy to see how people of Western culture have basically gotten the idea that humans are meant to be, you know, in, in control of all of the other living things, as well as all of the other stuff that's on the earth. Okay. Um, very different approach than what we see in indigenous cultures. Okay. So the Europeans first altered their own landscape in Europe and you know the British Isles and then they exported their attitudes worldwide um, to exploit the whole natural world and this is a set of pictures of the level of um, native forest um, on what is now the United States and in 1620 when Europeans first landed um, over here uh, there was continuous forest pretty much <laughs> all the way to the Great Plains okay and then there is the, the temperate rainforest out here and some mo montane forests over here. Um, by 1850, uh, the sodbusters had already gotten to Iowa and, and you know, the, in the Midwest and we're starting to grow crops. And you can see that things are starting to get lighter as the forest was um, cut down for agriculture. By 1920, pretty much, you know, complete devastation in terms of native forests. And um, when the Europeans arrived, they essentially launched into this massive land conversion from forest and native grassland to agriculture and development. And um, indigenous people and their knowledge were pretty much dismissed, okay? It's like, well, you know, they, they arrived and, and called Native American savages and said they didn't know anything, which was completely wrong because they knew a lot of things. And in fact, the Native Americans had been living harmoniously with Natural, the natural world for about 10,000 years by the time the Europeans came. Um, but they were dismissed by the Europeans who figured they pretty much knew better than anybody what was what. Um, we're reaping the, the, the benefits or the problems from that right now. This began what we think of as the extractive economy. Nature and all the minerals on earth became commodities for sale and the people who were the craftiest and who could get the most became the richest. Agriculture expanded and um, the agricultural system started to use uh, 
you know, a lot of tillage, fertilizers, chemicals, and erosion, all this ruined soil health, okay? It took the very rich soil that was in the Midwest and has pretty much wrecked it, sent a lot of it right down the Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico as silt. Um, our land has not been sustainably managed and ecosystem services have been degraded and we've had uh, destabilization because of loss of diversity. So this is in North America. Uh, we got loss of native, native habitats. We have diminished biodiversity and climate change. And an article at the end of last year pretty much summed it up. Rapacious economic activity and environmental indifference is destroying the ecological equilibria that protect us too. Okay. And people are like, hmm, either they don't know anything about it, they don't care about it, or they're among the wealthy class who is basically saying, hey, <laughs> This is all ours, so we, let's just take as much as we can get. Okay, so even what we eat has become very, very narrow um, uh, along sort of the lines of what European diets um, um, favor. Um, climate change is threatening agriculture, as you know, drought, heat, et cetera. Yet of 7,039 edible plant species as of 2020 in this report, 7,039, only 417 are considered food crops, okay? All the rest of these are edible, but nobody eats them. And of these 417, there are major crops, the things that are grown most, there's only 15 to 30 of these, you know, corn, wheat, um, millet, et cetera, cassava, stuff that we don't necessarily eat, but is eaten, uh, uh, is eaten worldwide. And the huge number, the thousands of edible foods that we are ignoring are basically, well, to a certain extent, there's a lot of germplasm, that means seed collection, et cetera, and they're trying to keep these seeds, you know, frozen up in Sweden, I think somewhere. Um, but it, it's not clear to me that these are really being protected and that we will actually be able to use them um, in the future if we need them as food. So we are likely to want some of these and I don't know whether they'll be there or not. Okay, so, now, some people, and maybe some of you are saying, so what, you know, I live in the city. What, what has nature done for me lately? Okay, I don't go to parks. I don't go outside or whatever. Nature does a lot for everyone, no matter where you live. So um, the jargon for this is, the, is providing, quote, ecosystem services. Um, these are all the interactions between living things, soil and water that provide a healthy environment. And so these um, ecosystem services are shown on this wheel and divided into different kinds, just so people can remember them. So there's the basic, basic supporting services like photosynthesis and habitat and biodiversity and soil. Okay, so these are this is kind of all the things that make uh, life on Earth possible in the first place. And then there's the provisioning services. So we obtain provisions from um, ecosystems, water, clean water, especially food, medicine, raw materials like wood. Um, uh, and then there's the regulating services. So we know that healthy ecosystems are able to control wholesale flooding, regulate the climate. Back when we had a healthy ecosystem, the climate didn't do what it's doing today. Um, healthy ecosystems clean the air and they clean the water. We know that, for example, um, tree cover removes a lot of air pollutants. Um, pollination, this makes sort of the um, continuation of um, higher plants possible, of course. And then there are the cultural ecosystem services, aesthetics. You know, Where do people wanna build their houses? On the coast and in the mountains, because it's so beautiful. It gives both of those environments fill us with a sense of awe, almost a spiritual sense, okay? Um, of course, there's a lot of recreation that's done in nature and a lot of education. So these are sort of what's called ecosystem services. Our actions have compromised the supporting services, soil formation, biodiversity, habitat, photosynthesis, and climate change and biodiversity loss are crippling the rest, okay? They're not doing a lot for these either, but um, we're kind of on shaky ground right now. And again, because of this Western attitude, um, essentially people and corporations are taking what they want, what they can make money off of without considering the cost, the biological cost, the human cost, et cetera. But I've said this before, I'll say it many times again, 
I don't care who you are. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care wh whether you live in a penthouse in New York and you feel you're immune from everything. Not even humans can fight the laws of nature, okay? It's like people say on the coast say, well, we'll just put up a seawall. <laughs> I'm sorry, you can't fight the ocean. The, <laughs> if, the, if the tropical storms are gonna come and get whipped up by climate change, your seawall is not gonna help. So humans cannot fight the laws of nature and it's just hubris to think that we can. Okay. I wanna talk about deforestation next. And before I do that, I wanna just tell you a little bit about tropical rainforest because there's just uh, the coolest places ever and they're the most diverse, biologically diverse places on earth. Um, in a tropical rainforest, I don't have a sort of whole rainforest picture here, 75% of the biomass, that means 75% of sort of the mass or the weight of all living things is insects, okay? And I, I happen to love insects, so uh, <laughs> I, I love that idea. One meter square of rainforest, a little bit bigger than a square yard, might have 50,000 different insect species. Now that's biodiversity, right? And here's a, a, a classic picture of all the different kinds of beetles. There's more different kinds of beetles than there are any other living thing except my, microbes. And a lot of them are just outrageous. And some of the most outrageous ones are in the rainforest. But there's also amazing vertebrates in the rainforest. And I've got pictures of some of them. Jaguars, giant river otters, two-toed sloths. Okay, there's their two toes. Two-toed sloths are very cool because they have algae they, that live symbiotically in their fur and gives them a slightly greenish tinge. Uh, I don't know if they still have the two-toed sloth at the Baltimore Aquarium, but it's really fun to look at, to try to find actually. Parrots, outrageous snakes, like giant, you know, 25, 30 foot long anacondas who can eat <laughs> like calves. Um, and a whole array of, of very poisonous things, many of which are brightly colored. Um, this picture is one of my favorites. Again, I'm an insect person. And these are two species of butterflies found in Ecuador and Peru. This is one species and this is another species. Now you're saying, well, wait a minute, aren't you, you got that wrong. This is a species, that's a species, that's a species, no. There's three different forms of each species and they they're differently colored in different locations and they are poisonous, okay? So the two species get some, they get a benefit by looking like the other poisonous species because the predators learn better. There's a lot of different so-called mimicry, mimicry rings like this, many in the tropics, incredibly cool. Leaf cutter ants, they actually cut leaves, take them to their underground homes and grow fungus on them to eat. So they're sort of farmers of the insect world. And there's just, you know, wacky, outrageous insects <laughs> that you have to love, really. Okay, so there's a lot of cool things that live in rainforests, and when we cut rainforest down, we lose these things. Um, indigenous people have and are playing a huge role in protecting the biodiversity on the earth. In fact, they're doing more to, than anyone else to protect global biodiversity. Indigenous people make up only 6% of the global population, but because most of them have been kicked off their um, ancestral lands, they make up 19% of the extreme poor um, on earth and their life expectancy is 20% below the global average. So these people really mostly wanna stay out of everyone's way, but they, um, live in these very diverse areas with trees like this. And, you know, here's this little guy learning how to protect his forest at a young age. Um, in Amazonia, there's 1.5 million indigenous people uh, spread among 380 tribes. And there's, you know, about this many different languages, okay? And I will say this the first time now, but I'll repeat this later. Indigenous ecological knowledge, that is the knowledge that these indigenous people have of the sort of interactions, the ecological interactions of organisms in their environment is deep and it is, um, it is extensive. And um, it is an absolute tragedy that Western people have essentially kicked these people to the curb and ignored everything they know. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about plants. Um, uh, 
rainforests have structure with super tall plants that reach up to the canopy hundreds of feet. Um, and then they have, you know, mid-story plants and understory plants and, and they have very thin soil. So they often have roots that flare out at the bottom to hold these big trees up. Very cool. Um, so here's just a bigger picture. There's just ridiculously outrageous things in the rainforest. Here is a giant lily pad. Okay, this lily pad is like yard <laughs> across with this outrageous single flower, okay? Here's this flower, it's probably this big, right? Um, our favorite plant of all, the cocoa, the cacao plant, um, from which of course we get our favorite food. Um, this plant is called uh, Raphalesia, and the flower is like feet, three feet across, and it is pollinated by flies. So it smells, you know, not like a, a um, not like a rose, which or a, a, a flower that might be pollinated by a, 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 a insect that could maybe smell it. These smell like carrion, and they're pollinated by flies. Um, this was just discovered maybe around I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, um, and. Uh, if you look down in here, you might recognize some foliage that looks like houseplant foliage. Well, that's because many of your houseplants actually come from tropical sites. And there's just a zillion, well, really more than 200, 2,000 species of fish in, in the Amazon. We only have 80 in the U.S. So this is just like the proliferation of diversity. I just had to share that with you because I personally think it's so cool. Okay, these amazing forests are being plundered for profit, of course. And um, now that we have you know, remote sensing satellites and whatnot, we are really seeing better how deforestation is proceeding. A lot of it is illegal. And um, uh, in, especially in the Amazon, deforestation has been driven by agricultural expansion, but this has happened other places. Also, global causes of, causes of deforestation 2000 to 2018, um, almost all from agriculture. This is from growing crops. This is from growing beef, uh, mostly, well, livestock raising, mostly beef, a little bit of urban development, et cetera. This only goes up to 2018. And I, this is Madagascar. And I thought when I looked at this picture that a lot more deforestation had happened on Madagascar. So I looked it up and um, it, it has. The eastern um, coastline of Madagascar has been extensively deforested. 1.4% of all the forest was lost in just one year. Um, again, because there's money to be made. And so, you know, the people who want to make the money don't care who else lives there, who might own it, who it hurts. Does it hurt the environment? They don't know anything about biology. They don't think they have to care. And there it is but we all live on this planet together and that's going to become increasingly clear as time wears on. Okay, the causes of tropical deforestation. I already talked about agriculture, um, uh, et cetera, but this breaks things down a little bit more. Um, uh, this is from Our World and Data, one of my favorite sites. 41% um, of tropical deforestation is caused by um, uh, cutting down the forest to raise beef on pasture. So here's these mangy looking tropical cattle. Um, and here's pasture that's created by cutting down the rainforest. Um, and um, after, uh, after the pasture is not very good anymore, then they grow the beef in feedlots like this on soy that they grow on the exhausted pasture, or maybe they grow on newly deforested area. I'll show you that in a sec. 18% of deforestation is due to cropland for oil seeds. So by that, they mean um, like uh, soy and um, and canola, not olive oil, soy and canola. 13% um, tree plantations for paper and wood. Now to me, cutting down the tropical rainforest for paper is, you know, very close to being unspeakable. Um, and um, a lot of times what happens with wood is there are, of course, beautiful woods, mahogany, other highly priced woods, rosewood in the rainforest. Sometimes they'll go in and they'll cut these gigantic trees of these uh, expensive woods, and then they'll just sort of trash the rest. Um, this is a, um, a um, pine, 
uh, a palm plantation in probably in Indonesia, where a, a lot of the forest there has been cut mostly for palm oil, which is in everything, candy bars and baked goods and everything. And it's not all that great for you. So um, here's uh, what happens. Um, a lot of the time deforestation occurs by burning. They don't even try to cut down the trees for the lumber or anything. They just burn it all. Okay, now we know what that does. PM 2.5 in the air, lots of, lots of carbon dioxide released, lots of air pollution, and they just burn it. And then they plant, you know, they do this, okay? They either put pasture or they put palm or something. So when we deforest in the tropics, it, would, it releases carbon dioxide, of course. It reduces the amount of carbon that the trees capture and store. It removes habitat for important native organisms. And we're now learning it can even change the weather, okay? We know it changes the weather around the Amazon. And that is now of great concern because there's a point at which we won't be able to go back to rainforest. That's called the tipping point. And because the, there'll be so little forest left, rainforest uh, trees um, um, uh, exude water vapor, okay, as transpiration, which cools the area and that helps control the weather. But when you remove too many trees, it gets very dry and then you really can't grow trees anymore. And so it goes to savanna. That is a one way trip from tropical forest to savanna, much, much less diverse. So that is. Everybody's worried about that now. Okay, soybean production, that is rising because a lot of the pastures have now played out and so they're growing soybeans on there. Um, there are supposedly uh, sustainability pledges that have been entered into by international corporations that specify that soybeans should be grown on abandoned pasture. But there's not very much enforcement of this. And there was just, I think yesterday or today, this new report came out from, um, I forget what, what uh, oh, this is from The Guardian. Um, this report is this um, from Inside Climate News. It, it refers to this report. This is an area of the rainforest with the gold in deforested areas that um, are basically illegally growing. They cut down the, the forest to grow soybeans and they're shipping them to Cargill. Cargill is an American company. It's the largest privately held company, I think in the US, maybe the world, but um, they're sort of an agricultural products company. And they say, well, we don't buy these, you know, soybeans that are grown on newly deforested land. But <laughs> now that we can look at um, areas from, you know, satellites and, and other, you know, drones even, um, these lies are being revealed. And um, there's, uh, um, well, another, there, there's a lot of information about that now. Um, so people used to think that the, the, trajectory was forest deforestation to pasture where they would grow these um, cattle and then pasture to soybeans. But um, more and more actual forest is being cut down for soybeans now. So, um, and most of these are used locally, but some of them are laundered like the ones that Cargill gets. Um, there's a big paper trail of deception which allows Cargill to buy these soybeans that are illegally grown on new, newly deforested land. Now, here's something that I think everyone should be aware of. Um, all of us who go to the supermarket can buy beef grown in Brazil by deforesting the rainforest without even knowing it, okay? And so the Guardian found out, I can't forget where this when this was, 2021, that Walmart, Costco, and Kroger were selling Brazilian beef uh, produced by a company called JBS that's linked to the destruction of the Brazilian rainforest. The evidence for this is now absolutely compelling. Um, and there was an article last year, oh, sorry, this is from 2019. Rampant deforestation is driven by global greed for meat. Here's some more of those mangy looking cattle uh, on the mangy looking um, <laughs> pasture, which used to be rainforest. Um, now, the thing that is absolutely makes me mad is that the U.S. We used to the U.S. used to ban Brazilian beef, but the USDA decided, hey, you know, this is not too bad. 
So they lifted the ban on Brazilian beef in 2020. Now this company, JBS, supplies Brazilian beef perfectly legally to Walmart, Costco, Kroger, and Albertsons, which is the parent store of um, Safeway. And even more insidious, you can go up there and look, pick up a steak and it will be labeled product of USA due to the so-called country of origin laws that the USDA watered down in 2016 to exclude beef. So you could get beef from anywhere, including a newly deforested part of the Amazon, and it will be labeled product of USA because the country of origin laws exclude beef. How about other meat? Well, any other foreign meat can be labeled as product of USA if it's processed in any way. In other words, if they send the carcass and somebody in the United States carves it up into parts, they can label that product of USA. Now, I don't know about you, but that just strikes me as extra wrong. Um, there's a really interesting, there are a number of interesting exposés and I put all these links in here, which will be hot on the slides that you get. Um, but there's a really great expose about JBS. They've taken satellite and drone pictures of cattle in areas where they're not supposed to be any cattle, right around JBS packing plants. And it's, well, too much. Okay, now a lot of people say, well, hey, okay, you know, I'm not going to buy the beef that's raised in these CAFOs, confined animal feeding organizations where they pack a zillion cattle in and feed them corn. I'm not going to buy that. I'm going to buy grass fed beef, which is all natural, right? Well, it turns out that's not really okay either, because I did not know this until last week. Most grass fed beef labeled product of USA is actually imported. Now, it doesn't usually come from from um, well, maybe some of it comes from from the Amazon region. A lot of it comes from Australia, but we don't know anything about the grazing conditions or the methods or anything about it. So all the regenerative agriculture people who say, "Hey, grass fed beef is just really great," it sort of entered the mainstream. Well, now we're buying grass fed beef from South America. People also sometimes say, "Doesn't the scheme of grazing called rotational grazing sequester carbon?" Don't the cattle poop on the field and then that um, that uh, uh, builds up the grass and, and the roots sequester carbon. I did a lot of work on this when I wrote my soil, um, my soil uh, um, carbon report. And the evidence for this is extremely weak. And some of the studies are, are just unspeakably lame. For example, they often or usually don't even account for the fact that the, meth the cattle are burping out methane. So they might dig up the soil and measure how much carbon is in it, but they forget, oh, wait a minute, the cattle are actually um, <laughs> spewing all this methane out. So that's you've got to take that away from whatever carbon has been stored. And it turns out that a lot more land area is required to you know, finish cattle on grass than it is if you put it in a confined animal feeding operation. There's just not enough land to replace CAFOs with grass feeding because the appetite for beef globally and in the US is so great that we'd be using you know three quarters of the habitable space on earth for, for raising if, if everybody got to eat as much meat as they wanted. I also am asked all the time, well, don't cattle mimic the action of buffalo? Aren't they really sort of just like the buffalo, especially if we make them move around in this you know, rotational grazing scheme? Don't they mimic the action of buffalo and re help restore the grasslands? No, okay. For one thing, there were 30 to 50 million buffalo across the entire US in 1800. Well, there's 1 1.5 billion cattle. Okay, so this is a completely different story. <laughs> and this leads to overgrazing, compaction, soil erosion, et cetera. So um, grass-fed beef is marginal at best. Okay, a lot of people don't agree with me, but fine. Okay, now uh, here's a little piece of good news. Um, now that Jair Bolsonaro is out and we have a new president, Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva, or Lula for short, um, things are looking up in the Amazon. Jair Bolsonaro allowed the you know uh, criminals who are doing all this illegal logging to and mining too, but to seize indigenous land, they would burn the forest and put their illegal cattle in there. And Bolsonaro thought that was great and totally looked the other way about it. Now the government agents like, you know, this guy and and um, I guess this guy looks like a European, but anyway, this um, 
uh, government agents are cracking down on this. They're trying to find and remove the illegal cattle in the indigenous territories that were set aside in 2011, okay? Um, the indigenous people still live on these territories that were set aside, but they're in danger from these criminals who are who are raising illegal cattle and want their land. And the, those guys just don't care what happens to the indigenous people. Um, so the government is now trucking these cattle out of there on, in big trucks. But this, this is from The Guardian. This is from this, this paper in The Guardian article in the guardian the caption here is criminals have tried to impede the removal of the herds by setting fires along the route great you know so it, it, these people are skulking around in the rainforest just doing whatever they want no matter what um but the government agents are making some headway and deforestation is declining although it is still at dangerous levels and we are still in danger of reaching a tipping point illegal mining is also being targeted in a, there's a lot of illegal gold mining on indigenous lands, very isolated that were back in the Amazon forest. Um, it was, you know, again, encouraged by Jair Bolsonaro, previous president. Um, and essentially wealthy criminals regard the Amazon regions as theirs. Hey, that gold is there. I've got the money to go get it. So it's mine. Um, this is leading to deforestation and contamination of water and soil with these heavy metals. Now the government agents are establishing permanent bases so they can go out from there and destroy these things. So here they are approaching um, a building as part of an illegal mine. And here's one shooting a, at some infrastructure over here, again, from articles in The Guardian. OK, now that's it for deforestation. I just have a, one slide on the beneficial impacts of changing diet and cutting food waste, which we covered extensively uh, three weeks ago. Um, but these two individual climate actions, very powerful, can also reduce impacts on biodiversity, but it's not totally straightforward, okay? It turns out, we talked about various diets last time. Um, this up here, this is the land footprint that required for various diets. This is baseline, okay, sort of what people are eating now on average. This is species committed to extinction. If we continue with with the baseline, you know, over 200 species are committed to extinction in the next, you know, short period of time. Um, uh, if we reduce food waste by 50%, that reduces the footprint a little bit. Um, the different diets are, again, baseline. So these are under food waste reduction. The Mediterranean diet, the USDA vegetarian diet, and the planetary health diet, which I discussed last time. Um, the vegetarian and planetary health diet are the best for biodiversity. Um, uh, and, you know, the Mediterranean diet is very good for health, but it um, emphasizes um, more dairy and farmed fish. And so the farmed fish are especially bad for biodiversity. And the dairy, of course, is using up some land. Um, so these healthy diets include bear, uh, more dairy and farmed fish, which is bad for biodiversity. These healthy diets increase fruits and vegetables. And a lot of these are imported to the US from biodiversity hotspots. So this is these are healthy diets, but you gotta be really careful about the fruits and vegetables. So to reduce biodiversity impact of the US diet by, whoops, by 50%, we need to cut food waste at least by 50%, if not more shift to one of these two diets, okay? And avoid imported produce whenever you can. So in the summer, you know, we can buy US produce either from California, uh, from California and Florida uh, through a lot of the year um, or locally in the summer, but don't search out fresh fruits and produce in the winter. For example, we don't need strawberries and raspberries from Chile in December. OK, so those those are bad for biodiversity because they could be grown in deforested areas. So just use a little good sense when you buy your produce. OK, so cutting diet, cutting food waste and changing diet could cut the number of species doomed to extinction by half. OK, that's not bad. OK, that's a that's a good step forward. OK, now here's the last topic. Conserve 30 to 50% of Earth's area for nature. We need to protect the remaining biodiversity across all of the ecoregions 
and restore the degraded areas to build them back up. So this is a map of Earth's 846 ecoregions. Well, what's an ecoregion, you ask? It's a combination of sort of um, uh, temperature, soil type, uh, drainage, weather, climate, et cetera. It, it's a region of a unique ecology, um, which has a unique group of species. And there's 846 of these. They're not all super big. Um, probably around 550 are really being um, considered for you know, action. Um, but we need to uh, capture the remaining biodiversity as much as possible and rebuild what we've lost. And this has to involve indigenous people. Now, what part of the earth are we gonna preserve, okay? 15% is protected now. This is from a, a 2020 paper in science. Um, and for the rest, we don't wanna just choose any random area to preserve for biodiversity. We want to pick the areas that have the highest biodiversity or something special about them. They have rare species. They have a lot of endemic species. Endemic means found nowhere else. Like Madagascar, for example, has a lot of endemic species because it's an island, same with Australia. And, and you know, so many species are found nowhere else. So that makes it an important area for biodiversity. We want areas that are connected so we don't have little teeny pockets of, uh, you know, preservation surrounded by stuff that isn't preserved because that's, you can't maintain populations like that. Um, and we want um, as many as possible to be occupied by indigenous communities who know how to take care of them. Um, Okay, it is absolutely crucial to protect indigenous people and their knowledge because they know things we don't know. Um, indigenous territories overlap with 40% of all protected areas, which is good, and 36% of intact forest land. So there are a lot of indigenous people on these lands and th those areas show less biodiversity loss, but these indigenous people have been stripped of the power to govern their own lands. So less than 1% of these protected and intact forest land are controlled by indigenous people. That means their knowledge is not being put to use really. And they're volunteering their time at great danger to themselves to protect these areas. Um, it's tragic, but it's not hard to read, you know, to come across papers um, uh, describing how indigenous peoples, especially indigenous women, are increasingly subject to violent confrontations by these crooks who want to cut down their forest or take their rhinos or whatever. Um, uh, and well, that's just wrong, so wrong. Um, this is a, um, a graphic, a very nice graphic that shows um, sort of how indigenous peoples fit in. 6% um, of the world's population, 19% of the world's poor, they occupy a little over 20% of the Earth's territory, but they are responsible for almost 80% of protected biodiversity because they care about it. It is part of their world and they respect it. Um, here's a really good general paper if you're just interested in this, you want to read more and here's specific references. Um, traditional ecological knowledge, that's kind of a buzzword, but it, it, it describes the type of knowledge that indigenous peoples tend to have. Again, many, many different indigenous groups across the world, but they share some common features. They um, are what is called place-based. They live in a place and their people have lived in that place for many, many years. And they have many generations of observations made on these places. And they have they make very detailed observations and they pass on what they have learned in oral history. Okay, so it's like this wellspring of knowledge which is passed on. We really don't have anything like that. Some of this goes back 10,000 or more years, 15,000 years in some cases. Um, these folks are out there observing, noting the conditions and the interactions that um, appear to uh, pro uh, provide good harvests. And over the years, they make small environmental changes to produce those favorable conditions. And this is a really cool paper um, called, um, oh, I forget what, exactly what it's called, but something like um, preserve the ecological function of um, indigenous peoples. And so here are these place-based societies and they do things, they burn 
the surrounding landscape to increase subsistence returns. And this actually also prevents a lot of rampant wildfires like we have. That increases landscape diversity and benefits these societies. They dig up starchy tubers in a lot of places and, and, um, and eat prey that's burrowing around. That turns the soil over and increases sort of the health of the plants. They hunt and um, cause fear. This seems a little weird to, to say it like that, but they hunt other animals, which benefits um, primary producers, plants, and consumers. And um, they take away long distance transport of inedible, inedible seed, which disperses stuff that you know grows um, native plants, but there's a higher density of edible plants near settlements. So these folks over tens of thousands of years have observed and figured out, well, what does it take to you know produce the kind of um, harvest that we need to keep our people going? Now, they don't grow more than they need. They don't take more than they need. So they have basically been subsisting on this, using this knowledge for years. This knowledge has been completely discounted by Europeans um, in, in the US and there are other places where they colonized and excluded the indigenous people. And this has not stopped. People have not, you know, Europeans are still doing this. And that is, well, uh, terrible. One thing that we did in our country that is a real blot, I think, on our history is that when the U.S. national parks were set up, the Native Americans were removed from their tribal lands within the park boundaries. And this, these four panels are from this document from UNESCO. But I'll just read what happens when you kick out the indigenous people. The exclusion of indigenous people from many of Africa's national parks disrupted socio-ecological systems that have co-evolved over centuries. The notion that people need to be excluded in order for nature to be conserved is rooted in the Western ideology of wildness. Westerners think that to be wild, you have to have no people, okay? You certainly don't want to have Westerners in there because Westerners are going to take everything. But to be stable over centuries and you know tens of thousands of years, these indigenous people have been you know working with the landscape, um, and they know so much about it. I'll just read this: a Yanomami boy. This is in Upper Orinoco, Venezuela, part of the Amazon. Looks for honey. Yanomami have names for fifty kinds of bees that provide honey for food or medicine. They have terms for different types of hives top or base of the trees, inside tree trunks, fallen logs, each requiring different gathering techniques. This is what I'm talking about when I say deep knowledge. They know so much about these bees because they have watched them for hundreds of years and figured out, you know, what they're doing, you know, so they know how to collect from the top, from the bottom. They know how to keep these bees going. And I'll let you read these when you get the slides. I don't have time to read those now. But it is really time to foster and respect traditional ecological knowledge and to give a, um, in, indigenous people a seat at the table when we're talking about conservation. Okay, part of that is return control of indigenous lands to indigenous people. This has climate and biodiversity benefits. I've already described reducing deforestation, protecting biodiversity, but for the people who really only care about money, and you know economics, it turns out all these services actually provide economic benefits. <laughs> and somebody's figured out how much that's worth. So it, if you don't care about deforestation, I know all of you do, but for people who don't, for people who don't care about biodiversity, just say, hey, this is costing you money when you when you cut down the Amazon. And this is a marvelous report from World Resources International Institute, sorry, World Resources Institute about this. Okay, so where are we going? I think we need to go back to the future. The attitudes of Western culture toward nature are not working. I think it's time to cultivate some humility about the way we've approached things. And by we, I mean the Europeans, broadly speaking. Um, and you know, try to recover some ability to see that we were wrong when we discounted all this knowledge because we can learn so much about nature and sustainable land management from indigenous peoples and their tradition. You know, and if we only learn one thing, don't take more than you need and use it all, that would be a gigantic bonus. Okay, now, we need an attitude adjustment, okay? We can't look at humans and the biodiverse world like this. 
We're not on top. We're not in charge. We don't know how to maintain these things. Just we need to get over this and get back to this, okay? To recognize we are all connected in an interdependent biosphere. Human, humans just can't exist when too many na of nature's connections are broken, which is what is happening now. We need to recognize that one, what affects one living thing will eventually affect us all. What affects one species will affect all species. What affects one group of people will affect all group of people. Because the world is, when it comes down to it, a small place that is all connected. Indigenous people have had the right idea. Now, how do we get this? We need transformative change. And I'm just going to, I'm sorry, I, as always, I'm running over, but I just want a five more minutes to talk about how we get transformative change. We need to generate some social tipping interventions. And you say, what the heck are those? Well, here's a graph that comes from a fantastic paper in Proceedings of the National Academy in 2020. And on this axis is resistance to change. And on this axis is levels of decarbonization. In other words, how close are we to solving climate change? And so resistance to change declines, but then increases again, okay, when you reach a certain level of decarbonization due to powerful lobbies, entrenched habits. I don't want to give up my car. I don't want to do whatever. I've got a I've got an oil furnace. I don't want to change it. And then, of course, there's all the money involved in lobbying, big ag lobbying, the oil lobbying, et cetera. And that increases the resistance to change. So we get stuck. That's basically where we are now. We're stuck. And there's this activation energy we got to overcome if we want to get down here to a decarbonized state. That's where the social tipping interventions come in. These are uh, interventions or, uh, that make change that is controlled by social forces. And, uh, and this is obviously a cartoon, but the idea here is that each one of these might act as a weight Okay, sort of a, a weight that reduces the resistance to change. It drags this curve down. So you get to the point where, in fact, the earth can roll downhill to a decarbonized state. It's not going to roll uphill. We got to do something to reduce this. So social tipping interventions reduce the resistance to change and allow us to move to that decarbonized state where we want to be. Decarbonized state means we're not burning fossil fuels anymore and we're not letting beef burp up a, a bunch of methane. Okay, now this is a really complicated picture, but I have wrapped my mind around it to a certain extent. It comes from this report um, from the, um, oh, I knew what this was, um, it, um, in, International Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, I think. It's part of the IPCC, the UN uh, guys, climate guys. Um, uh, and they sponsored a work, co-sponsored a workshop on biodiversity and climate change. And here's the link if you want to get the um, uh, sort of the, the meat of it. Um, this picture actually comes from a, a, a really great article that was used in this report. And it basically says, if you want to change this immovable force, institutions, governance, and other indirect drivers and direct drivers of change in nature, if you want to move this invisible force, You've got to have some leverage points. We all know the principle of levers. And you've got to have some interventions or levers. So you've got to have something pushing on this that's balancing on the leverage point. And that's going to change this. Okay. So the leverage points are essentially points in a complex system, which of course is what we have, where small changes can have big impact. And they, um, this report identifies a group of these. And I want to just talk about two that I think are particularly important. Um, it would be very useful if we could embrace diverse visions of a good life. I'll read them, but I'll talk only about these two. Uh, we need to reduce total material consumption and waste, fairly clear. Reduce inequalities, practice justice, justice and inclusion and conservation. That means include the indigenous people. Elucidate and internalize externalities, that is like you burn fossil fuels and you get air pollution, but when you buy gas, you don't pay for the consequences of the air, air pollution. That's called an externality. And telecoupling uh, is you cause um, uh, damage somewhere else for a behavior that you engage in here. 
Um, ensure responsible technology, innovation, and investment, obviously important, promote education and knowledge generation and sharing. So these are the points in the system of sort of the uh, workings of the world where if we can change these points, stuff at these points, we can have a big impact. Okay. Now, then there's the levers. These are strategies and enabling actions for change. Um, we need to change the way we uh, incentivize things and the um, way we help organizations build capacity, coordinate across sectors and sectors and jurisdictions, take preemptive action instead of waiting for bad stuff to happen, know that it's going to happen and, and take care of it before it does. Adaptive decision making means make some decisions, see how they go, and then adapt, make different decisions based on what you learn. And, um, and then we need to strengthen the rule of environmental law. Okay, so I'm just gonna talk about a couple of these because I think they are really important. Okay, embrace diverse visions of a good life. Right now, I think the Western vision of a good life is defined by consumption or income. That usually what defines personal success. Societal success is defined by economic growth. Many people in the world, Westerners think like this, okay? You're important if you make a lot of money or if you have a big house, or if you have a lot of stuff. That's the definition of success. But there are other visions of a good life. So what is really needed to have a good, successful life? Well, I sort of read up a lot of, on a lot of stuff. This is just a grab bag, but sufficient resources, okay? You need to have enough food. You need to have a place to stay dry. An opportunity to contribute to your community and be creative. Um, it's important to have equality and to be safe. Okay, these are like sort of the baseline things people need to have. Um, other important elements of a good life ties to family and community and shared responsibility. Nobody, you know, it, you don't have a good life if you're just a free rider soaking off of everybody else. Um, most concepts of a good life include some acknowledgement of a spiritual force of some type. It doesn't need to be a Christian God or another type of religious God. It could be a spirit God like the in, um, indigenous people. Harmonious relationships with nature are important to a good life and a system of governance that promotes equality and freedom for everyone to enjoy all of these things, okay? So if you subscribe to these visions of a good life or even entertain them, you will realize personal success is not defined by how much stuff you have, okay? It's defined by contributing to your community. Okay. Um, I meant to, yeah, I meant to have this picture uh, here. Um, so I talked about this. Now I'm gonna talk about modifying incentives and capacity building. So that's a lever. It's important to eliminate perverse incentives that favor the destruction of nature and inequality. For example, why are we giving oil and gas companies tax breaks in the US equal to $13 million a minute, okay? Or maybe it's a tax breaks worldwide, $13 million a minute, every minute, every day, all year, $13 million a minute so they can discover new oil that we can't burn without you know, destroying the planet. I don't get that, that's a perverse incentive. And here's a fracking, a fracking rig, here's the oil rigs, of course. Um, Eliminate, the, eliminate these incentives that favor the destruction of neighbor, na nature or foster inequality. If you want to have incentives, direct them to positives, right? The things you want people to have, renewable energy, protection of nature and biodiversity. So the Inflation Reduction Act is hugely successful because it's directing in incentives to renewable energy. Although a lot of money is being wasted on carbon capture and storage, et cetera, as I discussed in a webinar earlier in the summer. They, they're getting, the fossil fuel company is just so happy they're getting billions of dollars for that. It is very important to reduce the impact of corporations um, through lobbying and gifts to politicians, okay? Now, it, we didn't always have carte blanche for corporations and wealthy people to give as much as they wanted, but um, uh, due to a law change called Citizens United, which sounds good, but is actually terrible, um, any any rich person or corporation can give as much money as they want and they don't really have to acknowledge it. Then so that just twists the system. Everybody knows that. Ensure that agencies and groups promoting change have enough capacity to do the work. 
enough money, enough people, enough, you know, what they need. Ensure that regulatory agencies have enough resources to identify and follow up on infractions. Um, one reason we're not taking in as much um, tax income is that uh, the various politicians have ensured that the IRS doesn't have enough money to chase down tax fraud. So we're missing out on like, I think I read today, $160 billion a year. The idea is change the system of incentives and capacity building to stop rewarding destructive, destructive actions and make it easy and desirable to do the right thing. How to produce social tipping interventions. Here's the big one. Unleash latent values of responsibilities to enable widespread action. What does that mean? Latent values of responsibility toward both nature and one's human community. For example, these latent values, which are shared by a large fraction of many societies around the world, include showing concern and care for those who, to whom we are connected, family and community, acting in a spirit of fairness and equity, resolving to do no harm through one's behavior, taking responsibility to promote institutions that enable care, concern, stewardship, and equity. These are called latent values because a lot of people uh, uh, might, back in the back of their mind, in their childhood, in their history somewhere, have learned these things, but they've forgotten them or they're not paying attention to them. They're latent. We need to bring these latent values out to the surface because when it comes down to it, there are a lot more people who care and could care about the world than there are really rich people and corporations. There's a zillion of us and a few of them, but they have all the power right now. Okay, how do we unleash these latent values of responsibility? Show others through your action that you believe in those values. Discuss the values in your community when you can, when it's appropriate. Advocate for local and state governments to incorporate these values into policy using those levers and the leverage points support institutions and corporations that act according to these values because this stuff changes social norms. People looking around, they go, yeah, you know, hey, that seems like a good thing to do. How do we do it? Talk to people about how these values pertain to climate change. That means all of us, right? And how they pertain to protecting and restoring nature because you might be surprised at how many people are receptive. This is a paper that came out last year um, in Nature Communications, very prestigious journal called Americans Experience a Fault Social Reality by Underestimating Popular Climate Policy Support by Nearly Half. Most people don't think their friends, their family, their community, they don't think other people care, okay, because they don't say anything about it. So uh, again, I talked about this slide last year. So we could talk about it. I can talk to you. Hey, let's talk about how we can stop climate change or restore biodiversity. You talk to your friends. Hey, let's talk about how we can stop climate change and restore biodiversity. And before you know it, we got a lot of people who are on board and want to do something. This is the, uh, I think this is pretty much the last slide. Who should be doing the talking? Well, I learned this from David Alexander, who's on the line. Um, he introduced me to this book, Diffusion of Innovations, which describes the trajectory of how a new behavior sweeps through a population. That's this behavior, proportion of the population. Nobody's doing it. Everybody's doing it. First, we have the innovators. These are the guys who think of it. Most people in the population don't trust them. They think they're too weird. Then there's the early adopters. And there's, you know, um, I, I, I don't have the percentage of these. Uh, oh, 13 and a half percent of the population is these early adopters. They're ready to get on board. They respect these guys. Um, the early majority, the late majority, the laggards. These guys are not doing anything. Everybody in the early majority is looking to the early adopters. Hey, how's that working out for them? Okay. The early adopters model the behavior. Okay. So early adopters are the best people to go out there and do the re recruiting or do the talking. Many will already have adopted solutions and many are valued in their communities. Who are these people? They are you. I've looked at registrations. I, you know, the people who come to these webinars are accomplished people by and large. Um, responsible jobs in government, lawyers, et cetera. Some people work in shops, some people you know, are teachers. There's a big diversity of people, but you all come to these webinars because you care about this topic and you want to make a difference. These people are you. Now, a lot of people who are in this part of the curve here want to do something, but they don't know what to do, okay? So who is, if you wanna spend your time most effectively, who do you wanna to talk to? Don't just talk to people at random because you might want to wind up talking to these people. They'll just yell at you. I don't believe in climate change, whatever. Most people are not going to be receptive. 
focus on people in this group, early adopters and early majorities, people who already are concerned but don't know what to do, okay? Those are the people ready to be mobilized, right? It's you, basically. You're already mobilized, many of you. So let the social tipping interventions begin. I am sorry I went on very long, as usual, and I left out so much. <laughs>